Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I hope you had a good lunch. Appreciate you guys sticking around with me uh, after lunch. Uh, we're going to be talking today about third party risk and what a monster has become and how we can get that under control. Um, first, though, uh, let's just uh, take a look at the pieces. First, we'll kind of do some backstory, uh, how we got here, uh, lay, the, lay the landscape and the scenario. Um, and by the way, uh, uh, apologies to people who aren't uh, role playing and D&D geeks, but there will be lots of references throughout there. I think I had that in my in my uh, abstract, so fair warning. Um, then we're going to look at uh, what kind of adventures uh, we have in trying to wrangle this beast. And finally, let's level up with some best practices for third party risk management and how you can get it under control. So. Uh, Quick, uh, shameless personal plug, who am I? Uh, Tony Howlett. I've been around InfoSec for over 20 years and uh, in IT for longer than that. Um, I've worked as uh, in various roles, CTO, CISO. Before we had CISOs, we just had CTOs uh, and done startups, uh, other companies. And I've worked in uh, pretty much every regulated industry, uh, telecom, finance, uh, government, and healthcare. I currently hang my hat at SecureLink. Uh, we're a vendor privilege access management software company. Uh, and in my spare time, I like to sail. I like to golf once in a while and uh, play the drums. Uh, so you see there some of my boring uh, professional headshot, uh, me doing something more cool, which is sailing. That's actually an America's Cup boat that I'm sailing. And uh, my proudest moment was when my band got to play DEF CON 26 in 2018. Uh, that was super cool if uh, you caught us there doing our live karaoke gig. Um, so, enough about me. Let's roll up a character and uh, get this show on the road. So, how did we get here? Um, well, outsourcing is a big part of it. Uh, and outsourcing is great. Uh, it brings us a lot of benefits. Um, and we kind of eased into this situation. We started outsourcing non-core functions, right? Uh, I mean, if you look back 10 or 15 years ago, uh, you know, you really didn't, if you outsourced anything, maybe it was accounting, something like that, or sales management. But as time went on, uh, we outsourced more and more functions to the point where now many companies actually outsource significant parts of the IT portion of their core business. Um, you know, a lot of banks now, uh, they use a, a, a SaaS platform for their entire bank function, basically bank in a box. Um, a lot of hospitals are using technology vendors for their key. You know, it's not just a doctor with a, ch a chart anymore. They use a lot of technology, so they depend on those vendors. And it pretty much covers the entire um, IT spectrum, everything from your hardware, your software, uh, and even your infrastructure, where it used to be you felt like you had to own the servers, own the, own the colo, we slowly abstracted that to the point where uh, a lot of that is run by other companies. Um, and, you know, it's, like I said, there's, there's a lot of good reasons for that, and we like to have people do the jobs that we don't really want to do. Um, a lot of uh, talented IT people don't want to, you know, maintain a mail server. Uh, or maintain a website and do all these, you know, look through logs, spend all their time, especially if you're, you're, um, you know, a single staff or a small staff. So we like to have that in, as a NPC, a non-player character to throw out there to do those boring things. Open up that door uh, for me. Take that danger. So they, me, they help Tony, pull up. Sorry. Start, sorry. Sorry to pause you, Tony, real fast. Um, I believe your screen share is not sh showing right now. Sorry about that, everyone. Thanks for your patience. We'll move on. Uh, but anyways, uh, our NPCs can be useful, our vendors, our third parties, but they can, uh, what this has caused, this massive uh, outsourcing move, is this uh, tsunami of third parties with the average enterprise having about 67 vendors with some sort of privileged access within your systems and networks. Uh, you may have a few more, you may have a few less, but this is what the average enterprise has. On the flip side of that, the average uh, technology vendor has 238 customers that they service. And that creates a, a, a motivation for hackers to go after these guys. And we'll talk about that in a bit, but you can imagine uh, why hack one enterprise when you can hack one company and get hundreds of enterprises possibly. 
And this ends up with a lot of uh, vendor reps wandering around on your network. Um, hopefully they're not wandering around, they're doing the jobs they were meant to be, but maybe they get bored, maybe they're malicious, or maybe a hacker's taken over their account. Um, they might have privileged accounts, uh, maybe they're accessing it through uh, some simple form of access, like a VPN with not a lot of controls on it. Uh, they might be sharing credentials. Uh, maybe you've given them one login for the entire company, so they don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be putting different reps in, and now they've got that on a whiteboard in their, in their main office, maybe like in the conference room by the window. Um, and as I was saying, they're not just into your uh, backend systems or your website anymore. They might be running critical systems, databases, things like that. Uh, they might contain uh, sensitive data, uh, possibly regulated data uh, that you're supposed to protect. So um, that's a lot of folks wandering around, maybe not um, always as skilled as you might always think they are. Um, again, it's great to have this help, but and, and hopefully some of these folks are skilled, uh, maybe more than, than your companies, and that's why you've hired them, but they might also hire some new folks and be training them. Uh, and a newbie rep, uh, can get you in a lot of trouble. There's your first level character joining your party uh, and they could get you in a lot of trouble by uh, alerting the monster, knocking down the wrong door or letting a hacker in that door. And this perfect storm really has resulted in a lot of major breaches uh, that are related to some third party that come in via a vendor or a third party. Um, this is just a short list, but um, Target was kind of the uh, er large breach uh, back a while ago. Uh, you all, all probably heard about it when it happened. Uh, hackers got in, and it was at Christmas time, and stole about 41 million credit card records. It was a big deal. Uh, the company lost a ton of stock value in sales, and uh, most of the C-suite ended up getting cleared out. Uh, what you may not know is this was caused by a lowly HVAC vendor. Uh, a company that was really supposed to only work on cooling systems was in a project management system and hackers took over or got into that vendor, got into the network, uh, it wasn't properly segmented so they were able to jump onto payment systems and get, get those credit cards. Um, a little more recently, uh, this last year, uh, LabCorp and Quest Diagnostics uh, probably uh, have gotten a test from these companies. These are the largest companies that do medical tests. If you've got any kind of blood work, chances are you visited one of these companies for it. Uh, they were hacked 20 million plus records, uh, and this included their billing information of their customers and services rendered. So if you can imagine, um, you know, what kind of test you were getting, maybe it was an AIDS test or a drug test or a cancer test, very sensitive, uh, that PHI information that if you're in healthcare, you have to protect. Uh, and the way they got hacked is through a collections agency. Again, pretty low tech seeming, uh, not something you think of as being a critical vector, uh, but they did have all that information. They got hacked, therefore those two companies plus several others got hacked. Um, Capital One was also in the news last year. Um, they had a uh, online application form and it got hacked. A hundred million uh, credit card applications got stolen. And again, imagine what's on that. It's pretty much your entire financial history. So your social security number, how much you make, where you work, et cetera, et cetera. Very uh, valuable information to identity thieves. And this happened through uh, a broken AWS uh, application firewall. So um, again, the fingers are being pointed and Capital One says it's AWS's problem. AWS, of course, using their shared responsibility model says, no, that's your responsibility. And that, that legal fight will go on for a while, but Capital One is the one in the news. Capital One is the one getting sued for all those records uh, getting breached. Um, Another one, uh, this uh, MyFitnessPal.com app, and you may not recognize that particular name, but they run a lot of these uh, track my bike ride, track my run type of apps. They have a bunch of them, and they got hacked. Their customers' emails, usernames, and passwords were stolen. Uh, and if you think about what's stored on these PHI, personal health information, so it's going to be maybe your heart rate, uh, how much you weigh, pretty sensitive information. Um, and uh, that was 150 million records, like that's half the country in terms of numbers. Uh, and the way these hackers got in is through a, a security vulnerability in an acquired business unit. So um, the lesson here is if you're acquiring companies or maybe being acquired, you definitely need to do your due diligence because you don't want to acquire their vulnerabilities. Um, and that happens quite a bit.
And uh, my final example is uh, also last year, this was um, uh, what I call a mass ransomware attack, where uh, they launched attacks on 22 separate small Texas cities. Uh, and this affected their municipal sort of management systems, their law enforcement systems, 911, payment utilities or utility payments. Um, all the core things that a, that a small government does was shut down and demanded ransom. Uh, they launched it simultaneously so that it would be very hard uh, for um, these folks to, to react and it would draw a lot of resources. In fact, the, um, the governor actually declared a, a small state of emergency because the Texas Rangers security, cybersecurity unit had to come in and help. Um, we don't really know how many records were possibly stolen, but thousands of citizens obviously were impacted. If you needed to call 911 or needed to access a property record, you were out of luck. Maybe you're closing on a home. Uh, pretty pretty massive. Uh, several more have happened like this in Louisiana and several other states. Uh, and this came in through a managed service provider they all used jointly. Happened to be a company that that ran IT departments for small uh, police offices. So if you're in a really small town and you just have a couple officers, maybe they're just out there giving tickets at the at the uh, speed trap, but um, you don't have an IT guy and they would run the IT for you. Well. Turns out they weren't using MFA to get into those remote systems. It got hacked and uh, they got into all the other city systems as well. So that was pretty bad. Uh, and again, this is just a representative example. There are hundreds and thousands of, of more uh, out there um, that, that you can look at. Here's an example I think that uh, I like to, to bring up to identify a, a emerging vector uh, hacked by fish. Well, I mean, real fish. Uh, this casino had a large fish tank, like you see behind their, their uh, uh, check-in desk sometimes. And uh, of course, I doubt they were thinking this is a cyber risk when they when they put that in, right? When the fish gonna jump out of the out of the tank or whatever, but it did have an IP sensor in there, an IP-based sensor that would check the temperature and let the servicing company know when, uh, when that needed to be serviced. Well, they got hacked, they got into that, got access to the network, jumped over onto the payment systems, and of course got the, the valuable stuff. Uh, again, I doubt the IT people ever thought or worried about this little fish tank, um, may not have even known about it for that matter. So that just gives you uh, a feel for this world of IoT, of Internet of Things, and how much of a threat it's becoming. I think it's approaching the threat of the servers and workstations because we just have so many of these devices. Uh, Y'all may have heard of the, uh, I don't have a slide on it, but the Ripple, 20 uh, or 2.0, however you say it, uh, announcement about two weeks ago, they found a massive vulnerability, uh, actually 19 of them in this IP stack built by a company called Trek. You've probably never heard of them because they build uh, TCP IP stacks for uh, IoT devices like webcams uh, and things like that. Uh, and it literally affects hundreds of millions of devices. We don't really know the full number because we don't know who all use this, this um, uh, stack and even there's companies that use equipment that use equipment that used it so uh, we'll talk later about the um, supply chain problem but um, we don't really even know the full scope and this is going to be a problem for years and years trying to get uh, just this one issue uh, resolved so I mentioned earlier uh, the attraction of hacking a vendor or, or someone that works with a bunch of customers and has access to their IT, and uh, there has been a, a concentrated, uh, concerted targeting of vendors and managed service providers, because the hackers really see this as a force multiplier, right? Again, I can hack one company and get at, possibly get access to hundreds of networks, um, probably some some big people too, because a lot of these technology vendors are smaller than their customers, so I might be a little no-name, uh, you know, HVAC vendor, but you've never heard of them. Uh, but uh, they got into Target, and that's the kind of thing they like. Um, and these managed service providers provide services across a wide spectrum. I mean, IT services is probably the most common, but um, security, uh, web hosting, like your WP Engine and Wix, uh, networking services, MDM, uh, security monitoring, companies like AlertLogic and SecurePipe, uh, data storage, a la the uh, uh, Amazon S3 and so forth. Uh, and, you know, the big, big uh, state actors, the APTs, as we call them, advanced persistent threats, uh, are using this extensively. China 
uh, has hacked into at least 45 MSPs and tech companies, and they have actually specially designed tools to go after these these type of vendors. Uh, and again, that that Texas uh, City ransomware attack was hacked through an MSP. Um, here's a, just a specific example now. During COVID, they've even focused tighter on healthcare MSPs. Uh, nice guys that they are. Um, this Quampier's malware. Uh, targets uh, healthcare MSPs uh, and you know they're not completely heartless though uh, some of these ransomware folks have been offering discounts if you get uh, your healthcare organization gets what nice guys I mean I really appreciate them giving a discount to uh, our hospitals but yeah it's it's pretty bad and they they um, I'm being facetious of course they take advantage of uh, these situations and will kick you when you're down And, you know, uh, you may think that, uh, well, I've got all these uh, contract clauses and they're going to be liable for my breach and I've, I've locked them up tight in the contract phase. That's great. You should definitely do that. But in a large breach like some of these, uh, your, your third party, your small vendor is probably going to go out of business. They're not going to be able to shoulder um, the, the costs and, and, and the lawsuits that you're going to endure. So in the case of the Quest Diagnostics and LabCorp hack, the company that, that caused it, they went bankrupt right away. So that's going to be on LabCorp, Quest Diagnostics, and those other companies to shoulder the costs and the, the uh, burdens. And uh, I spoke earlier about the vendor of your vendor's vendor, and this is called nth party risk. So we're not just talking about the third party, we're talking about uh, the fourth party and the fifth party. Um, you can see that kind of webbing out from there. Um, so an example, you might have a vendor that does something for you they host some system you use but they actually store that on aws or some other colo provider um, etc or they might use some tool or something uh, that's another company that stores your data in some place you're not aware of and again it only takes a breach of one of those people in the chain possibly for the bad actors to work their way through um, so you may end up feeling kind of like uh, this fellow here uh, surrounded by a thousand orcs and getting attacked and, and and really surrounded on all sides. By the way, extra credit uh, for uh, knowing who this, th where this picture comes from. You can put that in the chat if you want. Uh, but um, that is how you might feel when you're trying to manage this, uh, like this massive web of, of third parties. So what we have is a bunch of different kinds of risks uh, that these third parties bring. Um, the operational risk, right? So these hospitals and uh, some of these power plants and manufacturing companies, uh, ransomware or any company really takes them down. That's time and money, right? Um, especially when you're talking about key infrastructure and healthcare, where it could be actually a, a life critical. So uh, you don't want to be down in those situations, and that's what the hackers know, and that's now why they're going after and using ransomware more and more as the primary attack. Um, obviously, security risk when you have all these users uh, connecting into your network and systems hundreds maybe thousands because if you have dozens or hundreds of vendors they're going to have more than one rep and you might have even thousands of users wandering around your network doing different things uh, the money uh, for these types of breaches is significant uh, the average uh, cost is up 6.4 percent over last year to 3.86 million that's average even the smallest breaches i can tell you every breach i listed in my in my table there is is a tens of millions if not hundreds of millions of breach and some of these are now reaching into the billions when you talk about the cost of the lawsuits and uh the regulatory fines and if you're in a regulated industry uh you're also looking at a regulatory risk so not only might you be hit with money fines and, and lawsuits but you might get shut down or face operational uh, limitations and so forth like with banks you have your charter uh, you can get cited and, and hospitals, the same thing. So uh, it's not just money, it's it's uh, uh, you know, regulators can come in and, and shut you down and even find you criminally liable if you're, uh, you know, if you're ne criminally negligent. So, all right, we know the problem is big. Let's sit down, let's form a party. Let's, uh, let's solve this problem. Let's go after it. Uh, what are we looking at? What are the challenges? Well, it turns out there's a bunch of them. Uh, if it was easy, it would be it would have been fixed a long time ago. 
Um, so here are some of the barriers to uh, a, a good solution to this third party problem. Um, well, first of all, money and resources. Uh, a lot of uh, IT and security departments still don't have third party management, third party risk management budgets. You have to, to make it up elsewhere or find it somewhere or do it in house. Um, you might be using the wrong tools for the solution. Uh, maybe you're just using the same VPN that your, your employees use. I'll talk about why that's a bad idea in a bit, but um, it's not necessarily designed for um, letting people outside your company uh, who aren't employees into it. Or uh, each vendor has their own tool. So they're then stuck with uh, having to manage, learn, and, and support. their are different uh, support platforms. There's no standard. Uh, you got vendor managers, uh, not you know all over the place, both in physically separate and, and logic, logical different divisions. Uh, so you've got all these folks who are managing, needing to get people in uh, that aren't necessarily part of your IT department or even in your at your uh, physical location. And finally, once you, once you do come up, if you do come up with a, a technological solution or a process or policy, you've got to get the vendors to buy into it. Uh, not so hard if you're a big company and they're a small company, but if you're a, a if they're the vendor is a say a GE Medical or someone, uh, it's going to be pretty hard to to move them off of what they're using uh, into whatever you want to have them do. So you end up with this this sort of teeter totter of needs, where as you increase security, the efficiency uh, of those vendors go down, and you might get complaints from internal uh, stakeholders saying, "Hey, I can't get this." app up and running um, they, they can't get into service it i'm sure you've all heard that we need to give them you know wide open access get rid of the firewall rules we just got to have this thing up and then also you have your vendors who um you know they're typically graded uh, and paid on on things like time to resolution and they have slas they have to meet security is not always one of them so um and you can build that in in this in, in the contract phase uh but it's not always in there so uh, as their requirements get met, some of yours drop off. And that's before we get to compliance, right? We can get the real security done, but then we got to satisfy the auditors. And it really matters to pretty much everyone now. 85% of companies uh, state that they have to get third parties to comply with their policies for a part of their regulations. And if yesterday or a year or two ago you were in a regulated industry, you most likely are now because of the privacy laws, right? The GDPR for EU, and now we have the CCPA in California. Um, so you may have been able to brush off GDPR concerns. Oh, we don't do business in Europe, et cetera. But uh, everyone probably has does business with a California company or California customers, and that means you do have to comply. So uh, this adds up to a lot of time. The average organization spends 17,000 uh, personnel hours per year complying with various regulations, audits, and et cetera. If you're in the finance industry, you know that, that you're, you're getting auditors, different auditors in and out almost every week. Uh, I saw that when I was in that side of the business. Um, so this adds up uh, to about nine FTEs, which we'd all love to have in our IT or security department um, to uh, do other things, to do more productive things than just pull paperwork. But that's the reality. We have to do it. So, we know the problem, we know the challenges. Let's let's see about leveling up here and how can we leverage uh, some best practices for dealing with this risk. Well, first of all, there's a lot of regulations, and your your organization may fall under one or many of these. Uh, so you might have a healthcare organization where you have HIPAA and high tech, but you also do credit cards. You got PCI. Maybe you're uh, you do GDPR, uh, you probably have to do CCPA for California folks. So there's a lot of regulations which have different stipulations, different levels of, of uh, stringent uh, things. So, you know, if you try to tackle them one at a time, you might end up like this where you're, you're arguing and uh, no, we need to do this for PCI, we got to do that for GDPR. Um, but, you know, you can really boil most of these down to three things. Uh, you need to identify and authenticate properly. You need to control access and you need to record an audit. Much of this is similar to what you want to do with your employees, but there's some important distinctions. I'm going to talk about those. So let's dive in 
and see what kind of best practices uh, and uh, spells, if you will, that you can cast it to, to get control of these vendors. Um, identifying your vendors. This is the this is the most important part. There's your identi identify spell, if you're familiar with the D and D. Um, problem is that most companies don't even know how many vendors they have coming in. 37% aren't even sure not only who their vendors are, but how many they have. And here's the thing. Uh, what I've seen is most companies who are sure of it are wrong. Uh, they might say we have 10 vendors or we have 20 vendors and um, come to find out they have 100. And it, it's almost universal. I've never seen someone have fewer vendors. They always have more because you've got SaaS vendors, you've got Shadow IT, you've got a lot of things going on that you didn't have 10 years ago. Um, but the uh, best practice is to move towards doing a comprehensive list of vendors. Um, and, uh, you know, I recommend starting literally with the general ledger uh, and, and seeing who you pay. That's not going to get all of them, by the way, because you might have uh, people writing off things on credit cards or on their expense report, like even AWS fees. Infrastructure on a credit card, it's very hard to track down if they don't report it. Um, but you want to end up with who they are, what are they doing for you, and they might be doing multiple things if it's a large company, and what are their access needs? In other words, is it uh, remote access? Is it on-site access? Is it privileged access? Uh, so on and so forth. And, and you know, this isn't something that's a one and done. It evolves. Obviously, you pick up new vendors, things change. Um, again, I've never seen anyone on the first round get everybody. But as you refine it, as you refine your process and get policies and procedures into place, uh, you can start to get closer to what you believe is the true number, the actual number of vendors. Uh, another thing that that uh, I recommend as a best practice is is not trying to manage these folks like your regular users in Active Directory. I know a lot of folks do this because uh, it's there, it's already a process, uh, but you end up with something like this where you have, you know, vendor Acme Sean, vendor Acme Max. Uh, it gets really unruly after even a couple of vendors. Um, it gets out of date. And, uh, you know, after some point you have more vendors and employees in your AD or again, the naming conventions break down. So uh, it may work for a while, but it doesn't really scale well. And there's some other issues with that too. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, generic accounts. If you get anything out of this presentation, this is probably the, the, the gem. Um, you know, having those, those shared accounts, those Acme Corp, uh, you know, you don't want to sit there and have to manage all their people coming and going. So you give them Acme Corp. And again, that gets posted on a whiteboard, shared on emails or sticky notes, and that that is uh, passed around. Uh, you know, it's it's just not great, and it'll also take you out of compliance with a lot of regulations, especially PCI and things. What you want to move towards is identifying every individual who needs access to your systems. You need a process that creates these accounts efficiently, gives them the least privilege they need, and then then offboards them when they're terminated as quickly as possible. Uh, that's, again, that's the gold standard. That's what you want to move towards. Uh, MFA, multi-factor authentication. This is probably number two as far as the most important things in this. Um, and this is becoming a standard now uh, in regulatory framework. So uh, again, PCI and a number of things, so just will require this. Uh, so if you haven't moved towards MFA, at least for privileged accounts, Highly, highly recommend it. It's a great uh, way to kill. A, 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 it's a great thing in the kill chain. And if you're going to do it, try to use a standard like TOTP. So if the vendor uses uh, Authy or Google Authenticator, whatever they use, it's going to work with your system. Um, and because uh, yeah, different vendors are going to have different ways of doing it. Um, so again, the, the more standard based you can, the better. Uh, okay, we've got them in. We know they're, who they are and, and so forth, but let's make sure that they're still employed there, right? We talked about the uh, how we're going to verify them, so how we're going to get them into the system. That onboarding process is very important, and then uh, ideally automated, and then how do we uh, offboard them? How do we know when that person's quit? Because we're not in their HR department, right? We, we, uh, we need to know and get them out of our system as, as soon as possible. All right, number two is uh, control. Um, you see there the control weather spell. 
I uh, wish we could control weather, especially in Texas. Uh, if only there were a control vendor spell, but here's the best practices to get you to that. Um, so again, I talked about uh, upfront, a lot of this is, uh, happens before the vendor becomes a vendor, when they're still being evaluated. Um, the more you can get into their contracts or the more you can uncover why you're evaluating them, the better. Um, you know, what access method is going to be used, require them to use yours, or at least know what it is and, and, and approve it. Um, require those individual accounts. You're not going to give them a generic account. Require MFA. Um, require them to sync up with you in when, when reps are terminated. Um, require them to, to notify you if they have an incident. And, and, so, and also if they are putting your data, if they're outsourcing, if they have downstream vendors that's handling your data, they need to let you know. All this is stuff that if you do it in the contract, you have recourse. If you try to do it after the fact, it's a negotiation and they don't really have to say yes. Um, you also, uh, again, once you onboard these folks, you wanna, you know, you wanna have a paper trail or at least a documentation trail to know uh, you know, who approved this, what department, what's the uh, application owner, and then uh, who approved it, who set it up, and then they have access. So you want to be able to unwind that, that process and roll it backwards so if there's a problem, um, you know where it came from. Uh, again, uh, you want to make sure this vendor is actually secure. Uh, are they using current and managed uh, endpoint protection? Uh, especially if, the, if they have reps that work at home, are they using, you know, free antivirus or any antivirus at all? Um, are they using the latest and greatest encryption, so forth? Are they basically meeting the same standards that you need to meet, and can they prove it? Um, I recommend, especially if you have a lot of vendors, that when you're doing your risk assessments, you tier them, because not all vendors are the same. Uh, your janitorial vendor carries some risk with them. It's mainly a physical risk. Um, but uh, they may, may aren't the same as necessarily as an administrative company managing your database. So put them into tiers and depending on what they have access to and what level of access they have, and this will allow you to uh, develop different systems and different levels of controls for different tiers of vendors. Least privilege, we practice this with our employees, hopefully. So we should definitely be practicing it with our vendors and third parties all the more so. Um, you really, really, really don't want to just throw your net vendors on the network with a VPN that's unsegmented. Um, that is the recipe for disaster. It's been the, the, the main technique for a lot of these hacks. Uh, if you're just handing them a VPN, uh, like your employees, you know, I always like to say uh, a, a VPN is like an Ethernet plug that's extended. Uh, you just let them plug right into your network, and hopefully they'll work on the servers that you've you allow them to. But Nothing is really to stop them from scanning the network, uh, leapfrogging onto other systems. This is pretty much a element of almost every successful deep hack. So um, make sure that uh, they have least privilege access, both from a network standpoint, from a host standpoint, even from uh, application ports on specific server standpoint. Uh, control. So uh, I talked about earlier, uh, you've got these application vendors and you've got your IT people and your security people. And uh, if the IT people are just being handed, uh, uh, they need to get access to an application that they don't really understand, right? They're not the expert. They're just the administrator of access. They will tend to, to do a less granular because they don't know and they don't want that application vendor coming back to them or manager or vendor saying, hey, we don't have access, got to troubleshoot this. So they might be uh, have a tendency to hand out more uh, privileged or super user access than they than they might normally. Um, if you let the application owners uh, delegate delegate down to them, uh, they tend to understand. Well, this user is just needs view only and so forth. They understand the application. Um, so this is a fairly new innovation here, where uh, there's technology. It's called credential vaulting that allows you to not have to hand out a password and, and a login to, to a user to get privileged access. Um, really all they get is access to a lobby and they can check out that privileged access for the time they need it and then check it back in. They never actually have the login, the privileged login. Um, and that's pretty powerful uh, because it, uh, they, if that, again, that vendor rep writes it down and leaves the company, they can't 
necessarily try to come in from a different angle. Um, and uh, also single sign-on, things like this, where you can turn off their access with a single switch. Uh, and if you can, again, push that, that authentication down to the vendor, uh, into their AD, uh, usually companies, uh, when they terminate someone, that's the first thing to go is their uh, network access. And if it's federated down to, to them, then it's gonna turn it off pretty much immediately. And you don't have to have a sync up process. It just goes away and they take it out of their directory service. So final piece of this uh, three-legged stool is, is auditing and uh, reviewing. Um, there's not such a spell in D&D, so I'm using the scrying spell, but you wanna be able to keep an eye on things. Once you've got them in, you've given them at least privilege, uh, now let's make sure they are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so a basic audit, you know, this might be like a VPN log is gonna, you'll know like destination and source IPs, maybe the username, uh, maybe a, a session start and stop time. Doesn't really tell you much uh, other than someone connected and maybe did something. But you wanna get more granular with your, your uh, third party logs. You wanna know who is the authorizer for this access? Why are they connecting? Is this regular course of business? This is what they do every day or is this an emergent, uh, you know, they're trying to fix some, some problem? Is there a ticket number in a, in a case system that you have? So you can go to that and see what's going on. Um, and ideally, this is the goal, the uh, holy grail of vendor audit would be to have your keystroke logs and your video capture of any graphical sessions. Um, you probably wouldn't do this for your internal people. There's just too many. But with vendors, uh, again, that just gives you an extra level of control to detect any problem uh, while it's happening, before it happens. Or worst case, if something has happened, you can sort of uh, put Humpty Dumpty back together again by backing up and seeing what they actually did forensically. So um, if you're looking and you're reviewing audit logs, um, if you have them in a bunch of different places, it, it gets really difficult to, to put the, the, the puzzle together. Uh, and if you've ever done this, if you ever tried to pull router logs, firewall logs, and then Windows uh, event logs and so forth, um, it can be a real hard thing to get them all synced up and see what's actually happening. So having a single source of, source of truth for your third party access and, and activity makes it uh, a lot easier to see the forest for the trees. You can kind of see what's going on, see if it's benign, or uh, you know, if it's not, you can investigate further. And if you're gonna keep all this great audit and, and uh, log data, you gotta look at it. Um, so a lot of folks only uh, look at their logs when there's a problem or when they think there's an issue, um, and that's probably too late. You wanna have a regular review process, uh, you want to have you know, automatic notifications when certain things happen, uh, tripwires, if you will, and things like that. So you don't have to uh, go to your logs after the things already happened, and at that point, it's too late. This is the reason why over half of breaches are discovered by outside sources. So you get an email or a call from the FBI or some friendly uh, white hat hacker or something saying, hey, found your data in this paste bin. Do you want it? And at that point, uh, you panic. So... Don't, you know, the way to get around that is to really look through your log data, have a review process, so maybe you can catch that before, uh, before it becomes an incident. So, uh, kind of at the end of my deck here, to summarize though, uh, the third party problem is, is a clear and present danger. Uh, it's becoming bigger and bigger as we have more folks on our networks and on our systems who aren't employees. And, um, you know, uh, there, there's a lot of challenges to it. There are ways to deal with these challenges. And at the bottom line is really third-party access uh, shouldn't be treated as regular internal employee access. You have to treat them differently and have different controls. So there's my information. Uh, if, if you want to email me uh, any questions later or get a hold of me about anything, 